Well, I just marked some of the important points. Yeah. Make sure you mute your phones. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. Characterization of H4 IC31 candidate, particles and composition, presented by Sasmit Deshmukh, an associate scientist at SGS Canada and Santa Fe Pasture LTD in Toronto. And also joining us, Marina Kirkadasa, who is the head of Biophysics and Confirmation Unit Biochemistry Platform at Analytical R&D North America, Santa Fe LTD. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Beckman Coulter. Beckman Coulter focuses on innovation, reliability, and efficiency. It's led us to become the partner of the choice for clinical research and industrial customers around the globe. Thank you for your sponsorship. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located at the lower left of your presentation window and type your questions into the box that appear on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of our presentation. Also, please notice that you are viewing this presentation in a slide window. To enlarge that window, just click on the screen icon located at the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right or use that Q&A button and let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Click on the button in the bottom left corner and follow the process for obtaining your credits. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our two awesome presenters, Sasmit Deshmukh and Marina Kirkadatsa. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, and hello, everybody. And thank you for joining us here for the, for the webinar. Um, we're going to focus in the today's webinar mainly on uh, one of the vaccine candidates, which is H4 IC31 TB vaccine candidate, and the characterization to do the same. Um, this involves the characterization of the particles and also the composition of the candidate vaccine. Uh, if we go here in the today's uh, outline, so we will see here some of the basic uh, things that we would like to emphasize on. Uh, in terms of the particle size and the particle uh, characterization of H4 IC31, which is a candidate vaccine, and IC31, which is the adjuvant used in this, uh, we do the phase analysis, light scattering, and electrical sensing zone. These are the two techniques we use for the particle size distribution analysis. Further to that, the pulse, which is a phase analysis light scattering, can also estimate the surface charge and zeta potential, which we will go into that details. Uh, the next thing would be to characterize its individual compositions, which uh, H4 and IC31 has as an IC31 adjuvant. It comes with, uh, with the two different constituents, KLK peptide and ODN1A raw material. So we will use Raman spectroscopy to investigate and identify the constituents. The next thing would be H4 antigen, which is a protein. That's, uh, that's the main part of this candidate vaccine. And we use several spectroscopic techniques to actually um, identify the structural changes associated with this as an effect of adjuvantation. And then finally, we will conclude today's talk for any more information uh, concerning about uh, the entire presentation. Uh, we, we, we already worked on the manuscript, and this is already under publication. It's not uh, published yet, so once that is out and published, then we will update this information with the lab roots, and you can have access to that for more information. Um, so let's go further and then focus on the size distribution, the particle size and, uh, and the surface charge. So we will do the characterization of the particles. Uh, before we jump into that, Let's, uh, let's have a look here. So the TB vaccine candidate, which is H4IC31, 
it has uh, two different constituents. One is H4, which is a fusion protein of two different proteins, which is AG, AD5B, which is this protein here, and then TB10.4, which is this protein here. So as you can see from the structural images here, bo both proteins have a predominantly alpha helical content. And then in AG85B, you can also see some beta sheets present in the magenta color, which you can clearly see there. So H4 is the fusion protein of these two. The other thing, which is IC31, this is an immunostimulant adjuvant. So this is a synth uh, synthetic adjuvant. It constitutes uh, antimicrobial polypeptide, which is a KLK. This is a leucine-rich uh, polypeptide. That's, this has a plus four net charge. And then the second constituent is a TLR9 ligand, which is an oligonucleotide referred as ODN1A. This has a minus 26 charge. So the combination of these two is IC31 adjuvant. So these are in the ratio, the molar ratio is 1 to 25, where KLK is in excess. And that's where the, the, the total surface charge of the IC31 adjuvant becomes positive. So it's a cationic synthetic uh, uh, adjuvant. Uh, we are working on this candidate vaccine in the collaboration with the SSI, Staten Serum Institute, and Valneva with the Sanofi Pasteur. So the phase analysis light scattering is, uh, is, is a technique where actually uh, we look at the scattered light from the colloidal solution. To give you an example, so we have a colloidal solution in the first example here where you can see the large particles. These particles, they move through the solution as a Brownian motion, and the scattered light is collected where actually we can have a look at the intensity fluctuations. If the particles are big enough, the intensity fluctuations is quite, is quite low, as you can see here. In the other example, if the particle sizes are small in size, the intensity fluctuation is, is more due to their rapid movement through the solution, which we call as a diffusion. So this is a very basic, uh, basic thing whenever we observe, whenever we want to actually look into the particle sizes through the phase analysis or the dynamic light scattering technique. The laser light goes through the sample, as it's shown here, and then the scattered light is analyzed to get information in terms of the particle sizes. In case of phase analysis light scattering, as its name suggests, we are looking here. The signal processing is based on the slight changes in the phases of the, the phase shift of the light. So one of the one of the light, which is the reference light, that that doesn't alter anything, and the, the light which actually goes through the colloidal solution can see a slight changes in the phase phase of the light, and based on that phase shift it correlates this information to the, to the diffusion of the particles and finally to the particle size. So this is the basic principle of the phase analysis light scattering method. Further to this, once uh, there is a charged particle involved into this uh, analysis, then there is an external potential applied, as you can see in this particular figure, through the optical probe and then the electrode. Once the external potential is applied, these particles move in a different velocity, so altered velocities. That is called as electrophoretic mobility here. So this is measured by, the, by, by this uh, instrument, which is a zeta track instrument here. And based on this electrophoretic mobility, one can estimate the zeta potential, which is actually the, the total charge of the particle. And this is important in case of uh, all the colloidal solution analysis and their stability. Uh, to give you for a further idea here, so electrochemical double layer, as, um, as the charged particle is suspended into the bulk solution, in this case it's a, it's a negative charge, for instance. So once this is suspended into the bulk solution, the counter ion will surround that charge and form a very strong stern layer, which is the adsorbed layer. So this is a very strong layer. After that, there is a diffuse layer where these actually counter ions or the similar ions, they can diffuse in and out of the bulk solution and, and form a layer around these charged particles. The zeta potential is the potential difference that is measured across this boundary, the boundary of diffuse layer and then the bulk solution. 
And as I explained in the previous slide, once we know the electrophoretic mobility term here, the viscosity of the solvent is known, the dielectric constant of the solvent is known, and then one can easily estimate zeta potential value based on Smoluchowski's equation. So the particle sizes uh, of H4 IC31 candidate vaccine and IC31 adjuvant alone is analyzed by using this pulse technique. As we can see here, the particle sizes are very similar in both cases, except the fact that with H4 presence with the IC31, the particle size is slightly higher and it has a narrow distribution, as you can see here in the blue curve. But besides that, they are very similar to one another. The next thing which is important to know is the zeta potential. So zeta potential is also measured using this technique and H4 IC31 and IC31, they have differences. They are quite large differences in terms of the zeta potential and the conductivity. So the conductivity is the surface conductivity of, uh, of the particle that we are measuring along with the zeta potential by the same technique. So since there is a huge difference in zeta potential and also the conductivity, we can use this technique to distinguish H4 IC31 formulation from the IC31 adjuvant. And the reason behind that is IC31 and H4 IC31, they both have IC31 in large quantity. H4 concentration is very low, so it's, it's going to be really a challenge to determine uh, H4 IC31 from IC31 from, by using any biophysical assays. So to overcome this challenge, the pulse technique works very well to identify and distinguish between these two different formulations and give us information about the particle sizes, zeta potential, and the conductivity. So after this, uh, there will be another orthogonal technique which we implemented here for the measurement, that's the electrical sensing zone. And to discuss that, I will hand over to Marina and then she will walk you through the ESZ. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. So, as Sosmit said, that I will continue on the electrical sensing zone method. I think in the meantime, you may see the poll question um, to um, basically look through and uh, uh, share your <coughs> knowledge or understanding about this method if you're familiar with it or came across it in your studies. Um, so basically, the poll question is asking about the advantages uh, of this method versus other particle sizing, and so few um, multiple choices uh, are presented. So if you could kindly go through it, um, that would be great. So basically, it's uh, particle size, particle count, colloidal stability, uh, whether it's independent on color, uh, uh, shape, and transparency. And so. Um, I guess we can, in the meantime, move to the next slide, and I start talking um, about the method. So, that. Um, call question now closed for now. So basically, you can see here the illustration uh, of the instrument we have, and more importantly, of the Coulter principle, which is used to, uh, is a foundation for electrical sensing zone method. Um, the um, the method is very, um, let's say, um, well, it's close to one century. It's quite old. Um, and it, when it was designed, it was mainly used for count of the blood cells. Uh, however, over time, it evolved. And uh, we found a good application for it, um, uh, for the uh, biological um, uh, compounds. Um, we have a manuscript. I think you will see it on our previous, um, uh, on the following slide where we have extensively used it for their biological um, uh, immunotherapeutic product called BCG, which is used for non-invasive bladder um, cancer. And uh, um, you may find there more details about the method and how it's applied. In this presentation, we share further the application of it to the uh, HYC31 and IC31 suspensions um, to, to characterize the, the product and the process. So the principle is that particles are pulled through orifice uh, concurrent with electrical current, uh, and they produce a charge in impedance um, uh, that is proportional to the volume of the particle which is uh, transversing or moving through the orifice. 
So in um, a low left corner, you will see the um, uh, schematic diagram. So it's a vessel or uh, the beaker in which the aperture is suspended. And um, I think I can draw it for you, um, just like Sosni did, um, just a second. So this is uh, what I'm referring to. This is the beaker, and um, the aperture is uh, right here in orange, you can see. Uh, so if you notice, there is a line here that um, shows that uh, there is a little um, opening there. We call it orifice, and that's um, the, um, sorry, um, the liquid is traveling through the orifice once the electrical count is, um, is applied. So um, the pulse in impedance originates from the displacement of electrolyte caused by the particle. And so this technique is really um, um, re um, working on the displacement of the particle and counting its uh, re relation to particle diameter. That's how you um, can uh, calculate um, part particle size. The voltage across the aperture ca um, basically creates this sensing zone, as it's described right here. Um, the voltage, um, the scaling um, of this pulse height and the volume uh, is used to acquire a size distribution. So basically, this method can allow you to, first of all, it's non-optical uh, non method. So you really here do not depend on particle transparency, on its color uh, or shape. You really count every uh, particle which uh, introduces the impedance in a, a flow as an event. So this is your count, and uh, um, the uh, um, intensity of it is related to the volume. So you count both count and um, uh, particle size. Uh, the volume is as a size. So there are two um, advantages. Another advantage is that within the, um, you probably noticed uh, right here, uh, there is a computer with a kind of lot of digital stream going, um, collected from the sample. Uh, so because the measurement is taken several times during the uh, experiment, uh, you're really getting an average of the signal. Um, there is a way to calculate error between each instance. And so if the error or standard deviation is uh, high, it's within the experiment, uh, not between the runs, I mean. Um, it means that uh, you have homogeneous, um, if the error is high, it means that you have heterogeneous solution. So you have a really distribution of the particles and you perhaps even have visible particles in your sample. Um, however, in case of IC31 and H4 IC31, we observe homogeneous solution. Uh, the standard deviation is very small. Um, that basically means that, indeed, it's, uh, the particle size is most likely homogeneous, even, and, um, um, and, and it's steady during experiment as well. So it doesn't change during the time of the experiment. This is why, using this method, you can uniquely characterize um, your colloidal stability during experiment. Not every method um, can, can do that, so that's the advantage of it. So if we move from this slide to the results, I have to close this one, yes. So here is the, um, um, basically, uh, the summary. So on the right-hand side, you see uh, the graph, so which is um, percent volume um, versus diameter. Um, so in our measurements, we found that um, IC31 is typically slightly smaller. It's uh, about uh, 2.9 on average. That's what we get. We get the, we're getting a range, but this is average. Um, then IC, H4 IC31, which is 3.1. Um, in a small table you see here, it's uh, a summary of our development study where we, um, uh, I think we used uh, several days, two analysts collecting data. And uh, mm, uh, that into, together allows us to calculate intermediate precision. So from round to round, from analyst to analyst. So this is the, really the numbers that you see. So in terms of percent CV, both for um, derived volume, um, it's, uh, it's very small. Uh, we're not sharing here the particle count, uh, but uh, what we learned that um, uh, particle count is reproducible from lot to lot of AC31. Uh, particle count is slightly smaller when H4 um, abounds to IC31, but nevertheless, from lot to lot, it's quite steady, and it's in a ballpark of um, um, a million. So um, we are also uh, suggesting to our colleagues that they can use particle count as a process um, characterization. 
um, because uh, that's a direct measure of reproducibility for the formulation and for sample prep uh, every time. So um, below, I think on the slide in a very small print, you see that you can look further in our manuscript. It's in a computational structural biotechnology journal. This work was also presented at the um, pep talk meeting. This is about the BCG uh, immunotherapeutic product. And because um, this paper is um, predominantly based on uh, electrical sensing zone, you can uh, look for more details about this method if you're interested in that. Um, so from that, um, I think a conclusion for particle sizing and charge is that um, uh, two methods, um, both PALS and ESD, are in agreement about uh, the size of um, adjuvant and vaccine. Um, and uh, they're in the range of 2.6 to 3.5 microns. Um, so um, also um, both methods illustrate that um, the uh, size of adjuvant is just slightly smaller than uh, vac of vaccine. Um, however, uh, I think um, um, the major highlight here is the PALS method, the one that Sasmith just presented to you, um, because it can differentiate between very clearly using the uh, Zeta potential uh, very clearly differentiate between IC31 adjuvant and vaccine. And for process, um, it's very important because if you have a bulk of adjuvant and uh, a bulk of vaccine, these suspensions very much look alike. Uh, so visual inspection will not help. Uh, whereas the pulse method, even from the step of the conductivity, right away you will see uh, the difference, uh, very subtle. And once you measure that the potential, the difference is very clear. Uh, it's almost half, um, um, uh, decreased by half of uh, the potential for vaccine. So that prevents mistake during the filling. Um, as you know, um, there is a step where we prepare product in bulk, and then it has to be connected to filling line. And so um, I think it's a um, discussion, and we heard it from regulators, that they want to see more techniques that can control each step of the manufacturing process. So this method is not just characterization, of the product, but you can also use it to control the process. So that's how we want to convey the value that we observe from this technique. Another thing that probably not mentioned here, but um, we talk about in the paper, and hopefully once it's uh, um, published, you will, uh, you will uh, read it as well, um, that the uh, charge is related to the uh, uh, dose of H4 protein, or H4 antigen, um, because uh, charge is directly re related to the ratio between uh, protein antigen and adjuvant. And in this case, um, the charge is positive and it's related to the uh, 1 to 9 ratio of the um, uh, protein and adjuvant. And apparently it's very important for those uh, to, to get an um, uh, efficacy response. And that was observed in uh, clinical, it's published now, it's in clinical studies, phase 1, uh, that they saw a response and uh, also in um, animals and in the, in the a whole blood assay published by Roger Brooks group. Uh, so um, moving to the next slide, we're introducing different technology now. Um, as uh, Sasmit mentioned, um, IC31 adjuvant is a biological adjuvant, which is consisting of uh, the peptide, KLK peptide, and ODN1 uh, oligonucleotide. And uh, those um, biological pro uh, products, they constitute raw material for us. And so to, uh, in order to characterize the raw materials, we deploy uh, Raman spectroscopy. So um, this slide in, in brief introduces the principle of Raman spectroscopy technique. So this is spectroscopic technique, uh, which is based on inelastic uh, light scattering um, and is used to observe uh, more molecular vibrations and other low frequency modes in the sample. So um, as you know, um, the majority of scattered light um, um, is um, governed under Raleigh law. So it's a Raleigh scattering when the incident light, which is scattered from the molecule, from the atom, does not change its frequency. Whereas in this case, there is a frequency shift. Um, the stock shift is uh, um, uh, recorded. And uh, um, this is uh, our foundation to uh, judge about different bones. You can relate to different bones. You can identify them uh, in the raw materials. And also, um, on overall, you get a signature profile which is unique to a particular compound, and you can use this signature profile for comparison from lot to lot 
Um, so on the lower panel here, you see Raman spectroscopy for raw materials and vaccine formulations. So uh, the panel which is presented at the angle, the, those are actually real um, um, graphs, real, uh, real spectra collected for raw materials um, for the media. And um, um, once you have a um, um, pr profile for the media or spectrum for the media, you can compare it with the individual raw materials and elucidate peaks that are present or remain present in the media. So that's another application we use. And this is just to illustrate um, how much you, uh, more you can do with uh, um, eye Raman um, uh, spectroscopy or Raman spectroscopy in general. We use specifically portable instruments uh, for the study of uh, raw materials. But the main goal in uh, this particular study that we're presenting here today is to um, characterize raw materials, use it as a basis or uh, for a lot to lot comparison, and also to monitor how stable these raw materials are. Because to formulate, um, you always have to achieve certain size, and as we learned from electrical sensing zone method, also to achieve certain number of particles after the mixing. And so, uh, obviously, any degradation and any alteration in raw materials can be um, problematic. Uh, so this is why it's good to know um, uh, the starting point, um, have a collection of good uh, um, representative spectra um, and use it as a reference for the future, um, uh, future raw materials, incoming raw materials. So um, on the right hand side, you can see the top panel belongs to KLK, which uh, produces quite a lot of peaks. And um, on the bottom panel, you have ODN1 oligonucleotide. Um, even just um, without the deep analysis, you can see that, uh, first of all, um, this is a tool to differentiate between raw materials, uh, like KLK and ODN1. You can distinctly see differences. Therefore, um, this can be used even to prevent mistakes during formulation because, as Sassman mentioned, uh, KLK is a predominant component, and so definitely you want, you want to have it um, correctly for the formulation. Um, and again, they both constitute white powders. They very much look alike. So um, to have spectroscopic definitive technique is, uh, is a good way to go uh, to, pre to have uh, correct formulation. So uh, this slide shows that um, you can actually zoom into the peaks, uh, identify peak position, and uh, also assign peaks to the specific side chains or bones and, and twists. And so. Um, that can be um, compared with uh, literature data, what is in, in known uh, for the peptide and oligonucleotide, and uh, basically assign accordingly. Therefore, um, the, uh, the bands were assigned to KLK and ODN1. So on the next slide, um, I think um, the conclusion from that, that the peaks identify, first of all, in close agreement with similar peptides and nucleotides published. Um, but also these peaks are fingerprints. They can identify raw materials. They can be used to um, qualify potential impurities and degradants. But more importantly, even at the very first step when you formulate your adjuvant, you have a control not to make mistakes and uh, use proper uh, compounds to uh, achieve um, desirable um, ratio. Okay, so I think with that, um, switching back to Sosmeet, and um, he'll take on the H4 uh, structure in uh, solution and in the adjuvant form in H4 isotopic vaccine. Thank you very much. So, thank, you, thank you, Marina, for uh, elaborating nicely on uh, ESD and uh, introducing the Raman spectroscopy, um, the way we use it to identify the raw materials and characterize it further. So. Um, as uh, we have seen that uh, what these techniques can do in terms of um, analyzing and characterizing complex uh, vaccine, uh, vaccine products here. So before I move on to the next uh, session, what I would like to do here is uh, uh, push uh, two of the poll questions here based on what Marina and I discussed so far so that uh, just to have an opinion what uh, audience is thinking on this. So as you can see on your screen, the question is, uh, what are the different techniques that can be used to identify the raw materials? So we have a couple of lists of uh, techniques there which you think might be useful to identify the raw materials involving the, the vaccine products and uh, not the protein itself. So 
So just uh, make sure that uh, you're answering questions, keeping in mind the raw material identification. And uh, meanwhile, once uh, you're answering the question, the, the second question that would also come on your screen, so that would ask you if the Raman spectroscopy can be implemented to elicit secondary structure of the protein besides the raw material identification, which Marina just mentioned. And uh, once the polls is closed, so hopefully you will see the answers on your screen, what majority of the people think in terms of uh, analysis of the raw materials, identification of the raw materials, and also if we can do the analysis and characterization of the protein secondary structure by using the Raman spectroscopy. So concerning the second poll question, I would go further and uh, then I'll keep explaining uh, what we can do here. So now we have the results already coming up and showing on the screen that the, the raw material to identify it's, it's Raman, which is actually true. Most of the time we use Raman spectroscopy, which is very easy and very straightforward to identify different raw materials. Besides that, I would also like to mention that FTIR is also used in that uh, particular sense because FTIR and Raman are quite orthogonal techniques and they rely on a basic principle which is similar even though they have a different selection rule which I will explain if I go into details of that. And uh, the, the, the other thing which other industry, uh, industrial applications or other people use is the ICP, inductively coupled plasma. So that is also useful technique to identify the raw materials and traces element, trace uh, metal into the product. The, the second poll result is also out as uh, all of you said yes, and that's actually true. The Raman spectroscopy can also be used to uh, elucidate and get information on the secondary structure of the protein, uh, which is not actually very common practice. So we explored more into this area, and then we decided to continue and uh, use the Raman spectroscopy not only to uh, identify the raw materials, but also use this technique to to go further and anal analyze the protein and characterize the protein's uh, structural changes with this. Uh, now, the next uh, section, what I'm talking here is the H4 antigen, which is the fusion protein, which uh, I described uh, earlier on. Uh, and we use uh, different spectroscopic techniques here to, to identify the structural changes because as H4, the fusion protein binds to the IC31, so inherently the matrix and the environment of the protein is changing. So we anticipate that there has to be a structural changes in order to compensate this uh, new environment which uh, fusion protein is seeing. Now these structural changes are quite crucial, so it's very important to know what's happening with the structures so that we can identify them and we can track this for, for the future references whenever we have this candidate vaccines in the process. Um, uh, another important thing here I would like to emphasize here, H4 IC31 is a very complex product that we are working here. H4 has a fusion protein, so all its components are water soluble. IC31 has two different uh, components, KLK, which is a peptide, and ODN1A, which is an oligonucleotide. These are water soluble too. But once they are combined to make IC31, they become, they form a particles, and these are insoluble particles. And they don't change once H4 is absorbed onto them. H4 is a very low in concentration, so it doesn't really uh, change uh, much of the IC31's uh, particle characteristics as you've seen from the particle sizes. So that's why we're dealing here with complex uh, substance, complex product, and then most of the techniques which uh, rely on soluble uh, assays, we can't uh, really apply those techniques here. And whenever we want to get more information, so the possibility is to desorb these components so that we will have a H4 separated from IC31 and analyze them separately or manipulate their environmental conditions in a harsh way so that we can get extra, we can get information what we are looking for. But both of these techniques involve a harsh manipulation and we are not probing actually native conditions what these samples are actually in. So keeping that in mind, we are developing this set of uh, new techniques which we can actually use and implement it in that direction to probe the native state of this uh, candidate vaccine here. So the next thing, what is uh, what we're going to see here is the Raman spectra of uh, H4 IC31, IC31, and the free H4 form. 
In the, in the top panel in the graph, what you see here is uh, we have H4 IC31 trace recorded, and we have IC31 trace recorded, as you can see, in a different color. The, the reason behind that is we want to see what, is, what happens with the H4 protein in the adsorbed form. So that's why we collected the, tra the spectra by H4 IC31 in adsorbed form, and then we're going to subtract IC31's contribution to that spectrum which you can see as a brown trace here in this, which is already subtracted IC31. So the brown trace here in the lower panel tells you only the changes which are coming from adsorbed H4. And the green trace actually tells you H4, which is a pure H4 without any IC31 presence in that. And as you can see in the lower, lower panel that the, uh, the spectral differences are quite significant, which we can actually rely on this information and get more from the, from the protein's structural point of view. Uh, there are quite uh, variations in terms of the, the spectral uh, features here, but I would like uh, to focus your attention to a tiny peak here in the green trace, which you can see here, and then another peak here, which is uh, again in the free form of H4 that belongs to the alpha helical content of the protein. And that actually disappears as, it's, as it goes into the adsorbed form, which uh, we don't see in the brown trace. The next important thing here, which is quite predominant, and uh, that I would say uh, the presence of this peak here, which, which gives us information that the beta sheet content is increased in the brown trace, which is the adsorbed form. So as protein goes from the free form to the adsorbed form, we've seen that alpha helical content decreased and the beta sheet content actually increased. So this is just the secondary structural information and then if you go on further, you can also estimate based on the other spectral features, which I'm not going into details here, but you can actually look for the amino acid side chains and their environment is changing as the protein is going from, going from the free form to the adsorbed form. So this is quite informative information if we can uh, get from, uh, from the Raman spectroscopy and considering the, the, the simplicity and uh, the ease of operation of the Raman spectroscopy. So this is uh, quite informative here. So we observed, this is very important to note here, we observed that the beta sheet content actually increased in the H4 in the adsorbed form. Now, obviously, the next uh, technique would be to check this using the circular dichroism spectrum. So the circular dichroism spectrum here we are using, as every one of uh, us uh, are familiar with the technique, we are using circularly polarized light, and we are actually checking here the absorption differences from the uh, left-handed and the right-handed light here. And this gives us uh, quite solid information about the protein's secondary structural information in the far UV range, which we are monitoring here. Uh, on the top panel here, the alpha helical content for the free H4 form is 16% and the beta sheet is 37%. If you can remember from the structural figure which I showed you earlier on, that we have predominantly alpha helical content in both proteins, the, the different constituents of the fusion protein. And we also had uh, AG85B having some beta sheet contents in the magenta color which I showed you earlier on. So that actually tells us that we have some beta sheet and alpha helical content. So we actually deconvoluted this spectrum using the Yang's model to get more information about the secondary, uh, secondary structural information here. Uh, now quite uh, peculiarly we can say that because we saw the minima at 208 and 222 that, that tells us that there is alpha helical content and then some beta sheet if you, if you deconvolute the spectrum further. After adsorption, what we see here, exclusively from H4, but in the adsorbed form, because we subtracted the IC31 contribution from that, instead of seeing the two minima at 208 and 222, we see in this case now only the broad minima at 218, which gives us an idea that this has to have a beta sheet content rather than alpha helical content. So deconvolution and analysis further tells us that the beta sheet content is quite dramatically increased here to 57%, and alpha helical content decreased from 16 to roughly 5%. So again, we are in the same line, so we are actually confirming the same results what we actually found from the Raman spectroscopy, and this is in line with the Raman spectroscopy results. Now, as I briefly mentioned that the Raman spectroscopy is also orthogonal method with the FTIR, the only difference here is the selection rule is different. 
Raman spectroscopy is based on change in the polarization versus FTIR is based on change in dipole moment. So this selection rule is different. So sometimes what happens, whatever signals we are seeing in the, in the Raman, we may not see in FTIR and vice versa because some of the vibrational modes are Raman active, some of the vibrational modes are FTIR active, as we all know about this. Therefore, we decided to go further and then uh, also did FTIR analysis on that. Uh, the FTIR analysis, uh, what we have in our laboratory, is based on attenuated total reflectance, which is, uh, which is actually um, uh, ATR crystal-based uh, technique, which is shown here, if you can see. Uh, I'm just trying to mark there to focus your attention to there. Uh, so this has ATR crystals where the, the infrared beam comes from one side of, uh, of the crystal and then it propagates through the crystals by doing several uh, reflections within the crystals. And on top of, uh, on, on top of the crystals, that's where you're going to deposit or you're going to put your sample on here on the surface. And as the, the light passes through the multiple reflections through the crystal, the evanescent field will transfer and travel through the sample and then this information is, is, is extracted and it's, it's analyzed by the detector, what we are seeing here. So this is a very sensitive way of uh, doing the analysis using FTIR so we could e e e extract much more information which we already saw from the Raman spectroscopy. And then this uh, particular thing, what we are seeing here, these are the ground state spectrum recorded for free H4, H4 IC31 together and IC31 as a separate. So free H4 is shown here in the green spectrum in the, in the insert, and then the red and the blue, they are H4, IC31, and IC31. And then we subtract the IC31 to extract information from the adsorbed H4 form, and then we compare that with the free H4 form. And as you can see here, the blue and the red trace in the lower uh, insert, they're quite similar. So we are actually probing here very marginal differences because uh, if you can recollect from my earlier discussion that H4 concentration is very less here. IC31 we use, as Marina also mentioned, in excess, which is a ninefold excess. So we are dealing here with a very little concentration of the protein. So we are seeing very small changes from the spectrum. That's why we had to use the different spectroscopy to get that information from the spectrum. And even though the different spectroscopy would not tell you precisely how much difference you are seeing, Therefore, the second derivative spectrum, the calculated one here, is, is a better way to get actually more information from the spectrum, and that's what we did here. So we calculated the second derivative spectrum, and as this is a second derivative spectrum, the peaks are upside down here, so whatever is downward, that's actually peak, because we are looking at the second derivative spectrum. Uh, within this uh, spectrum, as you can see that the, the dashed lines, which, uh, which are drawn here for amide 1 and amide 2 region, they are quite distinct if we compare the two traces, the free H4 from the green and then the H4 which is adsorbed from, from the H4 IC31, the brown trace. So at those dashed lines, there are quite pronounced differences. Already we are seeing that coming from the amide region, so there are already structural changes associated with that. But in context with the previous uh, of our findings that I would like to focus your attention with the similar findings, uh, the peak at this here, which is a 1689 peak, and then another peak at here, which is a 1588, this tells us that the beta sheet content in this particular sample increased, which we didn't see in the green trace in the free form. So the beta sheet content quite dramatically increased, which, is, which we also have the proof from the CD and Raman spectroscopy, so which is in line with the previous findings. Uh, besides this, there are some other changes also happening. Uh, so we have... Uh, we have a random coil changes here, and then we also have, have a small peak here, which is coming from the turn. So we can actually distinguish what's happening with the different secondary structural contents, and also what's happening with the amino acid side chains, which is uh, this region here. So we can also estimate what's happening in the, in the amino acid side chains as the protein sees the transition from the free form to the adsorbed form. So these tiny structural details and molecular information can be easily extracted from the complex material, what we are actually dealing with here, which is a candidate vaccine, and we can correlate this information to get more, 
more of uh, spectral information besides the particle information which we described earlier on. So this, this gives a whole set of, uh, set of tools where we can analyze, the, analyze and characterize the, the particles and its uh, composition, the individual constituents from the spectroscopy. And we can also probe the structural changes, what the, what the protein antigen is, is, is facing here. Uh, so again, we are on the same track here. The beta sheet contained is increased, as we've seen from the previous, uh, previous uh, two techniques. So this is actually quite, uh, quite good, and we can confirm that this is the changes which is uh, occurring in H4 IC31 candidate vaccine. Now, so far, we, we are sure that, okay, this is the changes. Alpha helical content is lowering, and the beta sheet content is increased as, uh, as it adsorbs onto the IC31. So what might be causing this? So this is like another question that uh, people might ask. Okay, the reason behind this could be the possible reason because this is not the only protein where we are seeing the alpha to beta transition switch. There are other proteins, for instance, uh, photosystem 2, that also undergoes alpha to beta transition switch under the bright illumination. And there are some other uh, proteins too in the literature where actually the transition can ha happen between alpha to beta and beta sheet to alpha helical content. In our case, our protein is, uh, is, uh, is longer than 26 amino acid residues. So once the protein, which has a predominantly alpha helices, it adsorbs and compactly packed onto the, onto the adjuvant particle, then it experiences the dipole repulsion within the alpha helices. And as a result of that, the alpha helices tend to stretch on the surface of the particle because they want to minimize the, these repulsive forces. And once it gets stretched, it converts to the more favorable form, which is the beta sheet. And that's why we are seeing here more of a beta sheet formation rather than the alpha helices, which is, which is, uh, which is energetically more favorable to have it on a particles, uh, particle surface. And uh, this is what we can explain based on the information what we gathered from, uh, from the spectroscopic data. So, in order, so finally, to conclude here, um, the PALS, so which is a phase analysis light scattering method, is, is a very effective way to differentiate H4 IC31 and IC31 adjuvant because uh, they are identically, they are very uh, identical uh, uh, formulations since we are dealing with high concentrations of IC31, which is nine folds in excess at least. And then this also gives us the zeta potential information. The zeta potential also gives us the charge information. So if we have a positive or a negative, then we can say that which particular component is in excess because H4 uh, IC31, as I explained, it's a, it's a cationic uh, due to the higher charges of uh, polypeptide KLK. And H4 is, uh, has a net negative charge on its surface. So we can actually estimate which one is playing role here based on the charge of the zeta potential. And the zeta potential also gives us an idea about, uh, about the stability of the sample because in other simpler terms, the zeta potential gives us information about the repulsive forces between the, between the particles. So if we have a strong enough repulsive forces, the colloidal solution is stable. If we do not have strong enough repulsive forces, the colloidal particles will coagulate and then sediment, so which means the stability is, is compromised in that situation. So we can extract that information from pulse and uh, considering the complexity of the, the sample, what we are dealing here. Uh, the second thing, what we actually um, Demonstrated here is the beta sheet uh, secondary structural content that increased as a result of adjuvantation uh, in case of uh, fusion protein H4. So that is also very, in, uh, very um, new information for us. And then we can use this information to probe the future formulations, the process changes, and, uh, and the lot-to-lot -lot comparisons to, to see if everything is falling in place. Because these uh, changes, even the, the structural changes with the H4, can actually uh, play a role in immunomodulatory uh, response. So these are quite Im uh, important parameters to actually uh, verify and study. Uh, the, the next thing what uh, we showed here is the spectroscopic techniques that can be used in a non-invasive way to get information about the, the structural um, content of the antigen uh, without uh, desorption step, as other techniques can also get the information, but then they have to deal with the desorption technique or they have to manipulate uh, their environmental condition in, in a harsh way. So to probe the native conditions, I think the set of uh, tools and the characterization package we just demonstrated 
uh, that, that gives some advantage to get more information and track this uh, in terms of uh, the, the quality of the vaccine development and also the processes. So uh, overall, this is, this is going to be a, a useful package that we also want to implement for another um, candidate vaccines uh, within the industry. Um, so hopefully, we, we provided enough evidences and enough information to, to actually provide some information and drive the workforce towards, uh, towards using some of these techniques in a non-invasive way to extract more information in a complex material. Um, so with that, uh, we would like to acknowledge a few people here uh, from Analytical R&D Biochemistry, Sanofi Pasture. Bruce Karpik is the director at uh, Biochemistry Platform at Sanofi, uh, Sanofi Pasture. Uh, for all his, uh, his support and his guidance through the project. Uh, Webster McCallus and Kamaljit Bhandal, he, they actually did the CD and ESZ measurements. Uh, so we would like to thank uh, those people. Also Wendy Chi, who actually helped us preparing the samples for the Raman spectroscopy. Uh, and uh, from the bioprocess R&D formulations at Sanofi Pasteur, Roger Brooks and Emily Xiao for generously providing us the samples. And uh, with that, I would like to thank all of you for being here with us and uh, listening to the talk. So thank all of you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Sasmit and Marina, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window type your questions into the box that appear on your screen, and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's go ahead and get started. We've got several questions coming in from our audience. In considering methods to characterize process versus methods to characterize product, are these the same? Um, yeah, well, as, uh, as we were discussing this, uh, the characterization process, if I understand the question correctly, so you're asking the difference between the characterization process versus characterizing the product, right? That's correct. Okay, so the characterization process, so if there are changes in the process, uh, that can be characterized in differently. So now, now we are trying to implement these techniques in an inline mode. So whenever there is a process, uh, the formulation process taking place uh, within the industrial setup. So we can monitor all of these changes in line by using the different probes for the Raman and FTIR, uh, and also for the particle sizing. Uh, whereas for the characterizing product, so we can also implement the similar set of tools and uh, rigorously characterize those in terms of uh, the different attributes which we presented uh, in, in today's webinar. And I think uh, the only thing to add perhaps would be when you characterize the process, you also look um, at different aspects, for example, like CPNs, uh, residuals. Residuals often constitute different sets of methods. It can vary from mass spec, it can be Raman as well. Um, um, we deploy the NMR, we have publication on the um, um, cholesterol <coughs> Um, um, basically, uh, residual uh, in the HSV viral uh, product. Uh, you can you can look up uh, Rahima Hatun, she's first uh, author there. So um, basically, um, it's uh, somewhat vary, but Sasmit is right. Um, the main goal for the um, process um, changes for, for let's put it that way for process validation is to examine whether um, any changes up in the upstream or downstream in the purification. Um, constitute uh, changes to the product. And therefore, characterization tools become very prominent in that regard. And they often are part of uh, all um, uh, um, electronic um, biological license applications that we have or uh, common technical document if you, if you submit it for EMA in a European agency. So bottom line is that they're part of it. Um, to, for characterization tools, you often come if there is an investigation, if there is any significant change in the process, or you see, happen to change sites, um, you change, for example, manufacturing buildings that occurred. Um, it, we're facing one right now. So um, a, a lot of tools that uh, you see here today is one of the examples 
um, they can be deployed for um, characterizing the process from building to building or site to site, if you will. Um, in terms of um, in depth for process, as I said, you, you may need to look deeper. You may go into media um, and uh, uh, check for excipients, check for your residuals, have other type of tools. They're not necessarily called products, um, but um, um, they're more process related, uh, perhaps. But um, overall, um, there is a maybe subtle difference. By and large, you have more similar techniques than different uh, for that uh, two aspects. Um, Thank you, Marina and Sasmet. We have audience members from all over the world today, and here's another important question coming in. What is the scope of minimum sufficient method development that would be capable to generate meaningful results? So I think that's a question about how you approach um, a new product, for example, something that you don't know much about or just challenged. Um, and so um, you probably go with the methods you know well, perhaps. Or if you know something um, like potential critical quality attributes of the product, you may come from that perspective. What is really important? What do we want to achieve? Um, so. Um, in our perspective, it's confirmation that is um, um, designed or is uh, presented in such a way that it can elucidate um, uh, immunogenic response, co um, uh, trigger immunogenic response. Um, uh, whether it's adjuvant has to be, um, in this case, TLR9 uh, agonist to trigger the innate immunity first before your ad adaptive immunity starts to work. So um, uh, from that perspective, I would say that minimal sufficient is um, I guess respect the method you choose um, and the requirements for the method. For example, in PULSE that uh, Sosmit presented today, uh, important is to do dilutions. And um, um, you may be um, well aware that uh, dilutions you make for one product are not the same for another. Um, but to get um, reasonable conductivity and in order to comply with Smolokovsky equation, you have to have certain values, I uh, think it's not to surpass what 500 conductivity, um, to, to get um, meaningful results. So that's minimal sufficient for perhaps. If you want to go deeper, then you check lot to lot differences and basically conclude uh, how confident you are uh, to um, uh, recommend this technique as um, your, for example, um, tool of choice and to take it from, say, uh, preclinical stage all the way to phase three because there are such techniques that you can. And there are some that happen uh, in the early stages. Um, we keep them maybe until phase two, and then in phase three we say that we have sufficient information. Um, we know that uh, they work well, but they're not as incisive as we want them to be, and we just phase them out um, uh, and make a characterization package uh, much more uh, slim um, and more uh, economical, if you will, cost-effective. Uh, to, to go into phase three. So minimal sufficient, I guess, is um, to comply with method requirements, um, to, be, to have certain concentration that um, basically are, um, appropriate for the technique, um, dilutions in that matter. Or, for example, for Raman, we learned that we cannot, um, for many, in this case, we better work with solids rather than liquids. So solids has to be dry. Thank you, Marina. Our next question coming in from our audience members is, what is platform analytical methods in your view? It is a database of possible outputs ready to answer questions quickly, or is it the beginning of product-specific method development? So um, I don't know, maybe Sasmit wants to answer. Or yeah, well, I would say maybe it's uh, more of a product-specific method development. And then in terms of uh, going back to the previous question also and maybe linking that to, to this question, so the scope of method development and also the product-specific method development, I would just like to add there is um, just keeping this uh, one thing in mind uh, about, uh, about, uh, about any method development that we are probing actually in native or near native conditions to avoid any um, results which are actually 
discrepancies rather in the native conditions because once we try to analyze, so the, the techniques would require different ways of analysis and different assay conditions, and we might alter significantly from actual native, native conditions. So this might give us some kind of uh, <coughs> results which are not exactly uh, related to what we are looking for. So it's, it's, it's critical just to keep that one thing in mind uh, and then try to develop method or assess methods which are actually capable to yield uh, in, enough information. Hope that answers the question. I'm just looking at the <laughs> time. I think. <laughs> yeah, we're close I, to. Um, I think you have. Um, we have time for one last question from our audience members. Here's another one. What is the charge of H4? Well, as far as we know, the H4 is positively charged protein. That's why we use KLK uh, as negatively charged to, um, um, to basically absorb it uh, for, for the, um, uh, because KLK is a um, negatively charged peptide, as far as I know. And so for absorption, that's important. You're saying it's the reverse? Yeah, it's, it's just the reverse. I'm just uh, correcting. So uh, H4, uh, the IC31 has a leucine-rich uh, polypeptide, oh, so which is a positively charged predominantly, and we are using IC31 way in excess, and that's why it's positive. So H4's net negative charge, yeah, yeah. Uh, it has a net negative charge, and we deduce that from the amino acid sequences, uh, what are the acidic residues involved onto the surface. Uh, so it's, it's a negative charge. And that's why we can have an ionic interaction between those. Yes, and also to mention that this is really strong binding. So if you want to dissociate, it's, um, it's possible, but it's quite hard. That's why we're kind of promoting here that um, to analyze as is in a native state as opposed to um, say dissociated state or denatured state. Yeah. And the formulation occurs about uh, 6.8. Um, pH 6.8, and then brings, uh, it, um, we bring it back to 7, 7.7, 7.78. That's the final vaccine uh, pH. Jasmine and Marina, thank you so much for today's presentation and for your important research. I'd also like to take the time to thank LabRoots and to our sponsor, Beckman Coulter, for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.